This video is brought to you by BetUS Sportsbook and Casino. Welcome back to Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast, also heard on the radio in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's Nevada, folks, not Nevada. If you hear somebody say Nevada, tell them they're wrong. Nevada. We are probably from on... New York if they say Nevada. <laughs> and we are on 101.5 FM KDON as well as uh, a home we've had for a couple years now, The Bet in Las Vegas, as well, both Odyssey radio stations in Las Vegas. So you can listen to us there on Sunday mornings. So if you're with us there, thank you so much for being with us. We are here to talk about Las Vegas Raiders football. If you don't already subscribe to the podcast, please do so. Uh, just go wherever you get your audio. Look for Silver and Black today. Don't forget to rate our podcast as well. We appreciate those ratings. Most of them are usually five stars. We get everybody once in a while has got a one star. Hey, you can't win them all, but uh, we certainly appreciate your support there. If you're watching us on YouTube, Rumble, uh, on X.com, on Facebook, we certainly appreciate you being with us. Hit that subscription button for the video and also the notifications bell. We appreciate that. And the chat is always lively, especially on YouTube. On YouTube during the show uh, on 9 o'clock on Thursday uh, when we air this, it's great. So you got to come in there and, and have some fun and talk with your fellow members of Raider Nation. I am Scott Cobranson, your host. And as always, I'm joined by my good friend and my partner here. That is Mr. Mo Moten. He's a senior NFL writer over at Bleacher Report, a little website you may have heard of. Also, the Raiders columnist up on sportsnot.com. Please follow him on x.com if you want to learn a bunch, not just about football, but about fantasy football, about basketball, about life, and sometimes life. food. Check out M O E M O T N. That's Mo Moten on X. I am at LV Gully, and uh, you can also catch my work up on sportsnot.com where I do writing, but nowadays I do a lot more video. So you can check that out as well. We certainly appreciate you guys uh, being with us. And Mo, uh, you know, hey, listen, camp, I mean, you talk about camp. Camp is kind of technically over. Now they're into the practice season, if you will, for the preseason games. I, I still always look at preseason as camp, even though technically I guess it's got a different term. But, uh, you know, we're hearing every day we hear a little bit, a little bit, a little bit of that. Vinny Bonsignor from the Las Vegas Review Journal will join us early next week to give us his impression since he was on the ground there. So uh, get ready for that one. Vinny's always a good friend of the show, a former contributor on this show. So we appreciate him coming on next week, and that's going to be fun. So just a little tease for you there. But we're going to talk about the quarterbacks, everybody's favorite subject, in this first segment. Second segment, we're going to talk about the offensive line. Tom Telesco did a great interview with my good friend and uh, just a great guy, and that is JT the Brick, of course, who works for the Raiders and is also, you can hear him on Raider Nation Radio, along with our good friend Q. Um, so, so we're going to get to that as well. So a lot to talk about. Mo, but so much going on in the NFL, as we know this year, you're covering a lot of it, the Brandon Ayuk stuff, all this jazz going on, but man, Raider fans, they just want to know, okay, who's going to be the quarterback? The last time we talked earlier in the week, Mo, it was sort of like, well, nobody's looking great. Maybe Minshew had, so you read somebody, Minshew's got a little bit of a edge and then no, maybe, maybe uh, Aiden O'Connell, the Irish cannon, maybe he's got a little bit, but nobody's really stepped up. And, um, you know, we talked about not pressing the panic button, but I want to have a discussion with you today, my friend, about why this goes beyond just who's going to be the starting quarterback. And, and there's a lot of issues that that come along with being the starting quarterback. And I want to get into that a little bit. But, you know, it, it hasn't changed much since we've heard. We've heard a lot of folks on the ground watching practice just saying, yeah, nobody has risen to the level of, hey, they're in the lead. We heard that also from Antonio Pierce um, and we and you and I talked about this first preseason game this weekend and what that would mean for the job. Um, how are you feeling so far before we get into the discussion? How are you feeling so far with what you've heard the rest of this week? I'll be honest, Scott, not too excited <laughs> so far about the quarterback <laughs> competition. I am excited to see these quarterbacks in the in the preseason because I think they'll both gain some momentum. I have a piece up on Sports Night that talks about that. Remember, Aiden O'Connell played well in the preseason last year. I know that was last year, but again, less complex offense. We should see him uh, show something <laughs> in these exhibition games. Gardner Minshew is a veteran. He's seen a lot of these defenses. Of course, teams played with vanilla defenses on the field. So we should see, see some sparks from him as well. But the importance of the cornerback position beyond the obvious that, okay, the Raiders need a leader of that offense pushing the ball down the field is it is a leadership position. Just like head coach, uh, 
the executive general manager, of course, away from the picture a bit. But when you look at a team and you say, how does how is a team constructed? Well, you're looking at the general manager who is in charge of the roster personnel. You're looking at the head coach who has his hands on the day to day activities. And you're looking at the, at the quarterback who touches the ball on every play, whether it's a pass or rundown. So your quarterback is not only the guy that is the maestro of the offense, but in a lot of cases, he's also the leader of your offense. Now, in the Raiders case, if Aiden O'Connell wins the job, he's probably not going to be the, the face leader of the offense. That's more probably more Devontae Adams, simply because you know he's not, he hasn't been there too long, but he's a Raider through and through. He grew up a Raider fan, so that whole jazz there. But with Aiden O'Connell and, and Gardner Minshew vying for the job, if Gardner Minshew wins the job, then you get more of a veteran leader who's seen a lot, been around the block. Not to say that he overtakes Devontae Adams as, as the voice and face of that offense, but then you give a more experienced leader, and I think that matters a lot too. So when it comes down to it, what type of leader do you have on the center, and that absolutely matters? It does matter, and and I will say this. like If you look at this Raiders team, you would say, and I think everybody out there listening to us or watching us would agree, the Raiders have leaders. That's not the point here. I think you look at Max Crosby on that defense. Clearly, he's a leader. I think they need more leadership on the defense as well. You can't just have one guy. Of course, Max is the quintessential great Raider. He he made the top 10 of the, of the top 100 players this year in the NFL, uh, which I thought was great. He was 17 last year. I think next year, if he does what I think he's going to do this year, he could even be top five. Who knows? But you look at that and you say, okay, great. So the defense, you have it. But on the offensive side of the ball, this is the only thing. And, and you tell me if you disagree. We might disagree on this one. But I look at a team's identity. And, and I'm sure people out there will have examples. Drop them in the comments. Let me know. And we can talk about it next time. But a team's identity is mostly shaped, in my view, if I look around the league and I look at teams who do really well, make that next step, or up-and-coming teams – they are shaped by the head coach and the quarterback. Now, with head coach, you got it, right? I mean, there's no there's no doubting Antonio Pierce has set a tone. He's trying to build a culture so you get the identity. He's 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 made it a point to describe what this team's identity will be under him. Now they got to deliver on that, but that's clear. Without the quarterback, I think it's a problem, and and this is where I would disagree on the fact that, yes, Devontae Adams can be, quote-unquote, a leader in the locker room. Obviously, he's one of the best in the game. He's a mature guy. He did it last year, but I think you have to have that quarterback. You have to have a quarterback who asserts themselves because guess what happens? If it's like last year and Devontae Adams has to be the, the leader of the offense again, what happens? Then does he not – does he get – does he get unhappy? He's not getting enough ball. You know, it's a different type of situation. And so I think that this is where the effective leadership, the vocal presence, I know Antonio Pierce talked about it with Aiden O'Connell that he was going to, and, and he said this months ago, he said, I told Aiden, he has to be more vocal and he means it, dude. And I think that's because for all the credit in the world, I'm going to give him Antonio Pierce understands what I'm saying here is you have to have that vocal presence and you have to have the performance, yes, but you have to have the guy who's going to be out there who's going to take charge. We know Gardner Minshew can do that despite his lack of talent in certain areas. Aiden O'Connell, if he's going to be the guy and maybe even be the guy long-term, if that went that way, he's going to have to develop that. So Devontae Adams could be the voice and face of the offense, I guess, in the locker room in a sense or when it comes to talking to the media. Yeah. But when you're on the field and, and in the field of play during the game, your quarterback has to be that guy. And I think uh, you can now I know people are going to say, you know, you guys always talk about CJ Stroud, but he's he's probably the best example. Right. Yeah. So he came in there as a rookie and you can talk to the, a lot of those players and they could say, well, we felt like even if we were down I, and I and I heard this from a lot of players on the Houston Texans during last during last season was. Even when we were down in the fourth quarter, we can always look to C.J. Stroud and we feel like we have a chance to win the football game. Whether we were down by seven with two, three minutes left or you know, trailing by two touchdowns, we always felt like we had a chance. When we look over at C.J. Stroud, we see his confidence. And he was a rookie. So that that, that goes to, to the part of leadership. And he may not, you know, Aino Khan may not be the best vocal leader. But do the players trust you to get them down the field in a crucial situation when when the time is right? When you have to get that completion at Devontae Adams or Jacoby Myers or whoever else it is, Brock Bowers, 
are you able to do that? Are you able to execute? Are you able to get guys lined up in the wrong, in the right spot? Are you able to read the defense and confidently be able to matriculate the ball down the field? I think that goes part to that leadership where he may not be the best vocal leader in his second year, but do your teammates trust you and do they believe in you as, as the maestro of that offense? Yeah, and, and, and see, that's the thing. Now, th I would say to you that, look, Yes, you could have a vocal leader at quarterback, and if they don't perform well, it doesn't matter. So if that's going to be somebody's point out there in, in with this discussion, I, I don't have any disagreement there. But I just look at the fact that quarterbacks, look, you got to limit mistakes. Either one of these guys can't make mistakes. That's what loses you football games. But the game management piece, the executive leadership, if you will, the idea that when you're out there, you're in charge. And you just brought up the great example of C.J. Stroud. It's like, look, when he was out there, yeah, he was a rookie. But he he wasn't a screamer. He's not a yeller. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is they have the trust, like you brought up, which was a great, great point. They have the trust in you no matter what the situation, but you also are holding people accountable. That could mean, hey, you're Aiden O'Connell. You're just a two-year kid. I get it, but you got to hold. If Devontae Adams is, is lollygagging, I'm not saying he does, but if he did or if he's dropping balls or whatever, Aiden O'Connell has to be the leader that says, hey, look, you got to step up, man. This is time. I can, I'm not going to throw you the ball if you do. So that's what I'm talking about. I'm not saying we don't we don't know if that's happening. It doesn't appear to be yet. We know Gardner Minshew can do it because we've seen him do it in the NFL, uh, sometimes at a high level. But this is where we talk about the quarterback situation. And this is where I'm more worried because I think every – I know the limitations of both these quarterbacks. So I'm not expecting them to be all pros. I'm not expecting them to be MVP candidates. But what I am looking for is someone to take charge, and and that's what that's what the, that's what uh, Antonio Pierce said. He's like, look, nobody, you know, nobody's really taken charge of it, and we hear that too from the beat writers on the ground. Our good friend from Q doing his videos every morning, he said the same thing. So we're we're hearing what we're hearing, and it's sort of like uh, I watched the press conference with Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell the other day, and. Um, they're both being very, as as you do, you're political with your teammates, right? You're, you're not going to come out and say, I'm beating his ass. I'm going to beat his ass. But you don't say that, but you need one of these guys. And it might be happening on the field. We just don't see it. But you have to, there has to be an alpha male here, Mo. Yeah, I, I was reading reports and this. There was a bit chirping between the defense and the, and the offense. And Minshew did some chirping after, I believe, Max Crosby <laughs> made a play. So I think when you when you think about the vocal part of it, I think Minshew has the edge there, just maybe just based on personality. Minshew's personality is more robust. He's more of the, the guy that's going to probably say something versus Aiden O'Connell where he's going to be a little more quiet. That doesn't mean Aiden O'Connell can't take charge. There are there are guys out there who aren't necessarily rah-rah out there, and they're, and they're leaders of their offenses. Jared Goff is another one in Detroit. Uh, I don't Jared Goff doesn't strike me as someone who's going to be, you know, screaming at his teammates but mm -hmm. he has complete control of that off he has complete command of that offense and i'm sure the guys around him respect him enough to trust him in any situation so i think part of it the first thing is you don't have to be a rich gannon i think I, a lot of rare fans when they think leader of an offensive fire leader, they think automatically rich gannon that's who i grew up watching too yeah and you remember rich gannon screaming and yelling at guys but ain't no kind of garbage coach. <laughs> right. They, they don't have to do that. It, I think right. it starts first with trust. Do you trust the quarterback? And I think after you build that trust with your teammates, everything else falls into place after that. Absolutely. And I think these next two weeks are crucial. I mean, we'll see the game and take a look at this, this preseason game against the Vikings for some of that. But going past that into the next week, as we get closer to the start of the regular season, it's got to happen. And I look at a great example of leadership. Uh, and it was on the defensive side, but that Chiefs game, right, when Aiden O'Connell had a terrible game, didn't complete a pass after the first half. But what happened? Max Crosby stepped up. Defense stepped up. He stepped up as a leader and said, no, 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 no. We're going to have to win this. And they did, right? They did because of their defense. You can't have that every game, right? you got to have leaders on both sides of the ball. And I think the need for that quarterback to step up and be the example is so critical. And can they start to develop that in the preseason? Absolutely. Look, Antonio Pierce said, Mo. No more baby steps, all right? He's not, look, Aiden O'Connell, we're not easing you in like we did last year. Uh, Gardner Minshew, you've been around. There's no easing in for you. So you have to take that. You have to create a sense of belonging. That was so great of you to put, to put that point out there earlier on, which is you got to get those guys on the same page. They have to believe in one another, but they got to believe on the field general on that side of the ball, which is the quarterback. And, and these next two weeks 
I think are going to be extremely crucial. Again, I'm not saying either one of these quarterbacks is the answer five years from now, but for this season to go off as well as some people think it could, one of these guys is going to have to do that and do it quickly. Think about this, Scott. The greatest quarterback competition has been so uninspiring so far that people are really asking me about Anthony Brown. There, <laughs> And I'm not saying this is like a one-off, like one Ooh. Raider fan asking me. There are multiple Raider fans asking me, hey, do you think Anthony Brown might have it be our quarterback this year instead of Aiden and Gardner? Do we have a sleeper oh QB3? And that, that tells you how well the quarterback competition has been going so far. But as I said, we still have three preseason games left. And I think once the preseason starts, and I said this, and I think Pierce said this on Wednesday, and I said it two weeks ago. I was like, I don't think you're really going to see this quarterback battle heat up until – they start to play other teams. Now, really quick, Scott, I know people want to say, well, maybe it's the defense that's just making the two quarterbacks look bad. You can give some of the credit to the defense as far as the, the simulated sacks are concerned, the takeaways. But when you talk about quarterbacks, poor ball placement, inaccuracies, that has nothing to do with the defense. That's on yeah. the quarterback. Yeah, and the leadership piece that we spent this segment on, right, which is yeah. like who's taking charge and saying, this is my team, man. Look, yeah. love your teammate. I'm not only trying to beat you, but I'm going to be the guy. I want these guys to rally around me. So we've heard a little bit of that, like you said, with uh, with Minshew talking some trash back and forth, which you expect with his personality. And that's the kind of thing you got to do. It's coming down to alpha dog stuff. So we'll see how it all rolls off. But yeah, don't. I wouldn't get too discouraged yet. I know the signs haven't been great, but like like you said, seeing them play live action is going to be interesting, and we'll we'll figure that out. All right. We're going to take our first break. When we come back on this edition of Silver and Black today, we're going to talk about the offensive line. Yes, Tom Telesco talked about it. We know Jackson Powers Johnson still uh, not on the depth chart. He is still injured. That's a concern. As Mo said, maybe uh, maybe you got up to three or four fingers on the panic button on that one. We'll see. We'll see. But do they have the depth if he's not ready to go? Do they have the depth to start the season without him? What does that offensive line look like? We're going to talk a little bit about what Tom Telesco said when we come back here on Silver and Black today, an Odyssey original podcast heard on 101.5 FM, KDON, and 98.5 The Bet in Las Vegas. Don't go anywhere. Michael Vick at BetUS.com. Catch an incredible 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits, plus 10% gambler's insurance. BetUS, my online sports book and casino. Welcome back, Silver and Black today in Odyssey Sports, original podcast also heard on the radio, on the radio. Okay, so I'm doing some Donna Summer. I think that's Donna Summer. Uh, on 101.5 FM, K-Dawn, and 98.5, the bet in Las Vegas on HD2. If you've got one of those cool HD2 radios in your car or at home, you can hear our our dulcet tones in just a great digital format. Anyway, we're back talking Raiders football. We talked quarterbacks last segment. Oh, by the way, the Raider Nation mailbag coming up next. If you want to call in and get on the next show, 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869. Or you can email us at mail at silver and black today. All spelled out, mail at silverandblacktoday.com. Scott Branson, Mo Moten, back with you. Make sure you follow the show and all the social media channels, you know, where all the kids are. Go check it out. TikTok and Instagram. Huh. That face. That. Yes. Yes. A shout out to our friends at BetUS who are doing some great video work with us. Uh, we certainly appreciate that. So check us out on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, X, and you can follow Mo at Mo Moton, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. I am at LV Gully, the show, S-N-B today. All right, Mo. Offensive line. Um, we look at this. Tom Telesco did an interview with with JT the Brick. I listened to a great job. And um, the the thing that I got away from, of course, Tom Telesco is not going to come on the air and say, "Hey, look, we're really worried about our offensive line." <laughs> He's not going to come out and say, "I'm I'm concerned," and we're I don't know if we're going to be able to start the season with a great line. No, um, I don't expect that. But I did like what he said about. The fact that despite the injuries to Colton Miller, who I think Colton Miller will be ready by week one, we don't know how much we're going to see him in the preseason at all. That's fine. He's coming off surgery. He's an old pro, so to speak. And so I'm not as worried about that. And I think you mentioned that the last last um, uh, show. Jackson Powers Johnson, we don't know. But he talked about being really, really uh, encouraged by the depth. He said uh, both Mumford uh, had stepped up and performed well in absences. 
and uh, DJ Glaze, who a guy that we didn't really expect a lot of this year. We thought, well, he can develop into a nice rotational player. Maybe he'll get some time. But I, I think that, you know, look, I think Tom Telesco, he's done, done this for a long time. He knows talent. And so what he's basically telling us is, hey, I believe even if we have some injuries, we got the guys who can go out there and do the job. Talk about how encouraging that is because, you know, it, that, you got to win in the trenches, my friend. And if you don't win in the trenches, you're in trouble, especially when you, you're dicey at quarterback at this point. Um, to have DJ Glaze, to have uh, Mumford Jr. doing well and to hear him talk about that, the fact that that Glaze has come in there and, and what Telesco said, Mo, was he's shown so much maturity that the veterans have even been impressed by that. That's a great sign. It's a great sign because the Raiders fans were expecting an offensive lineman to really pop at training camp. We yeah. just thought it would be Jackson Powers Johnson. Unfortunately, he's been hurt. I believe um, it was written in, in a piece that he has a concussion or concussion symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, check back on that. But it's been DJ Glaze, the third rounder. So uh, it's a pleasant surprise because it, initially you figured he would be competing for the swing tackle job behind Thea Mumford at right tackle and left tackle Colton Miller. But now it's looking like possibly the Rays may have a not, not an open competition, but maybe DJ Glaze can actually start at right tackle if Thea Mumford Jr. continues to struggle. He has a hand injury we've heard about, and why he's been on and off the practice field in and out of the lineup. So if Thea Mumford has an injury issue or if for whatever reason he's out, I think the Raiders feel comfortable with plugging in DJ Glaze, which is a good thing. My question is, what are they going to do about the interior? Because to me, the interior yeah. of the offensive line is a little more shakier than the than the outside, in my opinion. Assuming Colton Miller's back. Assuming Colton Miller's back for week one. And then you have Thea Mumford and DJ Glaze at right tackle. I, I think the Raiders will be fine at the tackle positions. How good will Thea Mumford and Glaze be as a combination? Or Thea Mumford first? Who knows right now? But the Raiders obviously believe in Thea Mumford because they didn't draft DJ Glaze to the third round. And they drafted him after they drafted a guard in Jackson Parrish Johnson. So for me, I, I can trust Tom Telesco when he says he's not worried about the offensive line because they have depth at the tackle position. I'm just a little more concerned about the interior. Now, Cody Whitehair, bit past his prime. Andre James has been there. He's a veteran. You move in Dylan Parham from left guard to right guard. While we all expected Dylan Parham to do well at right guard, he has had his struggles at camp. So we'll see mm -hmm. what he looks like in the preseason and come the regular season. Now, if they have to pull Dylan Parham for whatever reason, poor performance, who, who slots in at right guard if Jackson Powers Johnson isn't ready and you have Cody Whitehair at left guard, it would have to be maybe Andrews Pete. Yeah, and they talked about, or Telesco talked about that left side, particularly. And obviously, it's the inside. And, and Colton Miller, you got to get him back healthy and ready to go. But I think that one of the things he focused on in this interview was the fact that they are going in with the assumption that not all five guys will start every game. Of course, that just happens in the NFL. But also mm -hmm. that they wanted to preach and practice, and part of their strategy is having guys that are versatile, right? And if you look at not only the free agents they signed, right, but even those that they drafted, uh, including Jackson Powers Johnson, who played mostly center his last two, two years, right, in Oregon. Mm -hmm. He's one of the top center in college football. So you have guys. And so I think that that's the, one of the things that for me and for fans is to not put yourself – in the mindset of, well, this guy's going to play in that position and he'll stay there the whole time because whatever happens and what, what, how people adapt to those positions inside, outside, whatever, they're going to probably see, we're going to see different combinations, especially early in the season, Mo. Yeah. I mean, for the most part, you want your starting five to be out there for most of the games, most of the snaps, but injuries happen. Guy doesn't play well. I mean, Raider fans, we've, we've seen it, right? Yeah. Um, Jermaine Illuminar and and their Mumford alternating snaps at right tackle. Jermaine Illuminar moving inside the guard. Jermaine Illuminar moving to left tackle. So he was the he was probably the one of the more versatile Raiders from the previous regime. And I think this regime right now is carrying that over and trying to implant that in and most of their players saying saying, look, we know that you you're the you know the second string right tackle, but we may need you to play right guard. Okay. We may need you to play left guard. You know, Jackson Powers Johnson, if you're not ready to play left guard right away, Andre James goes down, God forbid, 
we we plug you in at center. You have the experience mm-hmm. there. So Andrews Pete, you talked about some of the free agents they picked up. Andrews Pete has played left play left tackle last year with the Saints. Most of his career, he was a guard. So he has the versatility. So what you want to be able to do is, regardless of what happens, you want to be able to plug in the next best guy. And he can play one or two, maybe three positions on that offensive line, and you'll still have your best five guys out there. Yeah, and I think it goes to the importance, and and he talked about the importance of young players developing, right? So you have somebody like DJ Glaze, and I'm not saying the guy's going to go out there and be starter week one, but it is vital, right? Especially with what we've seen with this Raiders team over the last several years. Of course, these were previous regimes, the two previous regimes, and some of their struggles in the draft. But to hear that, again, when you hear a player developing like DJ Glaze, I just tell people out there, take it with a grain of salt from the perspective of you want him to develop nicely. The fact that he might be ahead of the curve a little bit is awesome, but don't go out there expecting him to just jump in and be a starter, right? That's not what Tom Telesco was saying. He was saying, no, we got depth. So DJ Glaze getting some snaps in there when we got a guy who's got to come out because he's hurt or because there's, you know, it's a hot day and we need to just spell some guys for, for a possession or two, whatever. Those are the kind of things that, that I like to hear because that tells me that you have enough confidence to give a guy a break. Or if you do get in a situation, unfortunately, knock on wood, they don't have it. Somebody's injured. You go in knowing and are confident that your young guys are going to be able to play up to those standards. Scott, as you know, I cover the entire league and I look over these (laughs) offensive linemen snaps and I will tell you, it is rare to see five guys start every game and play every snap. DJ Glaze, for whatever reason, one way or another, he's going to probably see the field being that he's probably been there, arguably the most impressive offensive lineman who's not projected to be a starter. He's going to be that sixth man that's going to step in, whether it's at right tackle, left tackle, maybe play guard. If he has to, he was mostly a tackle at, at Maryland, played both sides of the line. That was one thing that stuck out mm-hmm. to me was that Antonio Pierce said, we, we talked about it in this segment, flexibility. They said they had him at right tackle, but they also plugged him in at left tackle. And mm-hmm. he held his own against, you know, some of the ones. So the defense. That's, a, that's, a, that's a good sign. And and he's one of the guys. And again, I had this piece out on Sports Not six guys I'm looking at in the preseason. He's one of the guys I'm looking at. He He's one of the guys I have my eye on because he can definitely be, I don't want to say a steal because he's a third rounder, but he's a guy that could possibly play quality snaps if needed and surprise a lot of people. Yeah, no doubt about it. And I think that that, that is huge. And, and to the point, DJ Glaze, we've heard so much about how well this defense is done in camp. And the fact that DJ Glaze is getting that much praise against a defense mm-hmm. that seems to be hitting all the right notes is huge and i'm glad you mentioned that because it's going to be um it's going to be fun to watch and see how he develops and to see how this all unfolds all right we're up against our second break here on silver and black today when we come back we get to your voice yes we get to the raider nation mailbag if you want to call in for the next show or send us an email do so 702-900-7869 702-900-7869 it's mo it's scott it's silver and black today coming back right after this Raider Nation, Scott Branson here at Silver and Black. Today, are you looking for a new sports book this football season? BetUS is the answer. They offer the fastest payouts in the industry with 125% sign-up bonus up to $2,000 or a 200% crypto deposit bonus. Enjoy a fast and easy deposit and withdrawal process with 24-7 personalized service, 365 days a year. BetUS provides live wagering on all major games and the best betting variety in the business. Plus, get 10% back on your net losses twice a year. Did you know that BetUS can give you your very own personal account manager? Check out the special offer from Silver and Black today. Use our BetUS link found below in the description, and good luck. Enough of hearing us talk about the Raiders. It's time to hear from you. Many Oakland Raider fan, Las Vegas Raider fan. Stand up. On this edition of the Raider Nation Mailbag. That, that, that black hole rock and rolling. Don't be a wallflower. Be a part of the show. Leave your question or message by calling 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869. Or drop us an email at mail at silverandblacktoday.com. All right. We are back. This is Silver and Black Today and Odyssey Sports Original Podcast. Also heard on the radio, 101.5 FM KDON. And the bet in Las Vegas as well. So thanks for being with us. And um, we got to start off old school a little bit today, Mo, because our, our good friend Gary Harkin Reader, who he takes uh. the off season, he takes the off season off. He doesn't send us a lot of notes, 
Um, but uh, he sent us a note. So Gary's back for the season. We love his his messages. And so we're going to get to that. But if you want to call in, 702-900-7869 is the number. 702-900-7869, your name, where you're calling from, and your massage message. Uh, all right. This is Gary Harkin Reader says, with all the talk and expectations on the cornerbacks, I'd like to see a second team front and linebackers with first team corners go against the first team offense. What do you think? Mel, I'm going to leave that one to you. He said first team corners against the first team offense. Second team front and linebackers with the first team corners go against the first team offense. So he's trying to mix and match basically the defense. That's correct. I, and I think, you know what? I think they already do that. I mean, it doesn't, yeah. I don't, I'm not sure if it gets a lot of publicity unless mm -hmm. a player makes a play or, or a turnover, but just like we talked about the offensive line, Getting mixed, get, getting mixed and match with Glaze playing with the ones and the twos. I think they do mix and match where they have the front, the second tier front with the first tier cornerback. But I understand why Gary is making this point because we don't we don't all know this, but I say this a lot that when you have a dominant defensive line, it makes it a lot easier for the guys on the back end. Mm -hmm. So what Gary's getting at is, well, what if you don't have a Max Crosby's and a Malcolm Kuntz's on the field to help your secondary and you have the second team out there, how good is that secondary? How good are your cornerbacks right. then without Max Crosby and your top edge rushers on the field? Which is a great point. And I, I would hope, I'm out of practice, but I would hope that the Raiders are doing this to figure out, okay, is it our defensive line that's helping our secondary? Or how good can our secondary be? Because you and I have been talking about the secondary is possibly coming along, especially with Ja'Cory and Bennett, maybe being the CB2 opposite Jack Jones. Yeah, and they, they do mix these guys in a lot because remember, when those players, if you're a second string, second team guy, and somebody goes down in the middle of a game, you got to go and you got to understand how the how the call, how the play calls are happening, who's calling the plays, the green dot on mm -hmm. the field. So you need mm -hmm. to get used to how that person operates, their cadence, all that stuff. So they do mix it in, but it's a great, it's a great question. Uh, yep. always Gary's always got great stuff. So thank you, Gary. We appreciate it. Glad you're back. All right, we go back out to the phone lines, and it is John. I think he's in Oroville, California, if I remember. Here's John. Hey, it's Scott and Mo. It's John from Oroville. And I thought I'd give you a call this morning and talk about the Raiders and our struggling offense in camp ahead of the Minnesota Vikings game this weekend. Uh, you know, one thing that occurs to me, we're looking a lot at the quarterback battle as for why are they struggling? Why are they not ascending? But when you look at it, well, look at Luke Getze over the past two seasons in Chicago, and look at how his offensive production was. Now, do you see a pattern there? I can remember a caller, a Chicago Bears fan, calling in, talking about how their offense had struggled for the past two years and how he felt we were going to see the same thing. I, myself, out of all of our OC candidates, Luke Getze was – I wouldn't even have had him on my list. I can't believe we chose him. However, we did. And I really am hoping I'm wrong about this and that he turns out to be this amazing offensive guru. But if you look at the last two years, he kind of showed you what his offense can look like. And I think we're starting to see that our offense is not ascending right now. So I'm hoping I'm wrong, but I am concerned. I I know, Mo, you mentioned this yourself. You didn't like that pick before we made it. I know he wasn't your guy that you wanted and certainly not mine. So I sure hope things turn out, and I hope I'm wrong. Hopefully our offense starts to ascend, but it could be no matter who's back there playing quarterback, they might be struggling. I don't know. Let's see what happens this weekend. We're going up against the Vikings who shut us out last year. <laughs> I know Aiden was in that game and did not have production, and I'm hoping to see him learn from that and grow from that. I like Aiden, but uh, this week will be a test to see if he can bounce back from last year's loss against the Vikings and that Brian Flores blitz pressure defense. I'm hoping he can, and I'm hoping to see a great performance this weekend. Let's see what we got. Let's go right on! <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There's John and Oroville. And Mo, it goes back to the Getsy question. I don't know that we can make a call on that yet. I think the game will be a big indication. We'll see how they run the offense in live action 
But the Getsy question is one we brought up months ago, and it's not going to be answered until we get into the season and we see how it progresses and how his offense does and how these players uh, mix in with what he's doing. Good memory, John. John's correct about that. I, Luke Getsy wasn't on my list of top five coordinators either. When, when uh, Cliff Kingsbury decided to go to Washington instead of be the OC of the Raiders, I would have been fine with Alex Van Pelt, who became the OC of the Patriots. I came coming out of Cleveland because I felt like coming from the Kevin Stefanski coaching tree, uh, I, I felt like he meshed well with what Antonio Pierce's identity seems like he wants it to be for the Raiders. So, and I also had Clint Kubiak on my list, but Clint Kubiak went and chose the New Orleans Saints and Derek Carr. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I had my reservations about Luke Getzey. I made it known very early. I, I get why some fans say, well, some of that is Justin Fields not being an efficient quarterback. I understand that, but you can't completely excuse Luke Getzey's part in right. that in that Chicago Bears offense that didn't perform well over the last two years. The one positive glowing thing that I could say about Luke Getzey's offense is, is the tight ends get involved and they're productive. And that's yeah. good for the Raiders because they have Michael Mayer and Brock Bowers now, but what about everything else? What You have to develop the quarterback because if you don't develop the quarterback, no one's going to be efficient or sufficient or productive right. and overly productive in that offense. So I'm with you, John. I still have my reservations about Luke Getze, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, and I think that that was part of the reason the Raiders ended up with the OC that they did was because their quarterback situation is uncertain. Uh, Cliff Kingsbury knew that the Redskins were going to get one of those top quarterbacks, right? So Raiders. where do you want to go? You're in an unsure situation in Las Vegas. You know they had Minshew at the time uh, and Aiden O'Connell. Um, not overly impressive. And so if you're thinking about, hey, I'm going there with a with a first time head coach in his first full season, you know you can see why that happened. But Luke Getzey, again, big question mark. We'll have to see how it all ends up. John, thanks for the call. All right, now we're going out to Lance. Hey Scott, this is Lance from Huntington, and I was going to call on the Tyree Wilson um, mm. comments that have been left online about his play. And I, I just think the guy's being treated a little unfairly. Um, I know that ever since he was drafted, PFF has basically established a media narrative that this kid's garbage and he never was going to be good coming out two surgeries. And that um, article that was put up by Vic Taper, um, you know, saying that he's not going to make an impact, but there's only one reporter that actually reported it on the, the scrimmage last weekend. He had two sacks and a, a pressure that forced an interception. And then that night, an article drops that the guy's not going to make an impact. <laughs> and AP stands up at the podium the next uh, yesterday on Monday morning saying that, you know, he's making big strides. So I, I feel that, some people have grabbed onto that PFF narrative on him, and he clearly started the year in his rookie season not ready, coming off two surgeries. And the only way that you're really going to get better is by playing football. I think the kid needs 500 snaps inside and outside this year, and let him let him learn how to win. Um, you know, if he shows up for a scrimmage of training camp had two sacks and a QB pressure, um, ended the season pretty strong. I, I think we should give the guy more of a chance and stop judging him. All right, thanks. There you go, Lance from Huntington. Good call, man. We appreciate it. And and Mo, you you look at this situation, and we, we like you said, we talked about it last show, and, and yes, I mean, you have to give a guy a chance, and by no means are, have I thought that, well, he's done, he's got no – that's not where I'm at. I know that's not where you're at. But um, for him to have 500 snaps, he's got to earn the job, right? And you earn that job in practice. And um, while Antonio Pierce was complimentary in some ways, uh, coach is always going to do that, especially when you're in camp. You're not going to go out there and say, hey, now he's not playing up to expectations. You're going to say, no, he's made some progress. So the, the issue then becomes how much progress can he make? How much progress can he find in, in his player before they get into the season? And, and that impact idea, the PFF thing, I get what you're saying there, but – we know Baldy talked about him last year. A lot of folks talked about him last year. So uh, it is it is camp, and until he gets on the field, Mel, we're just not going to know until we see it. I think two things get – not to say that Colin misconstrued this, but mm -hmm. there there's a misconstruement in, in 
discussing players in sports where if you point out a guy's uh, faults, you're writing him off. I yeah. don't think anyone's I, I don't think anyone reasonable with a logical perspective is writing off Tyree Wilson before he even takes a snap in the second season. What we're simply doing is saying there are some concerning signs there. Right. Pointing out someone's faults and concerning signs is not the same as writing them off as saying they're going to be a bum, they're going to be a bust. What I what I paid attention to, and I know, you know, different reporters will say different things about different players and what they what they report from the scrimmages. But what stood out to me is that in Vic Tafer's piece, it wasn't Vic Tafer that said this. This is a teammate saying this. Adam teammate. Butler said he's taking baby steps. Right. Vic Ta again. Vic Tafer didn't say that. This was Adam Butler. This is a teammate, a guy who's watched Tyree uh, Tyree Wilson practice and play over the last two years, well, since yep. last year. Yep. And Adam Butler came out and said he's taking baby steps, which tells you that his development is incremental, not significant. Now the coach is going to get up there. He, as you said, not going to throw his first round pick from last year under the bus. You're going to try to prop that guy up because you don't want the media to come after him and say, oh, this guy's a bust because you don't want that playing in Tyree's head. You're going to prop him up. Yeah. But it's obvious that there are concerning signs there. Does that mean he's going to be a bust? Does that mean we're writing him off? No, we're just simply saying, you know, if he doesn't play well, if he doesn't get on the field as much as you think, just remember the signs were there. The writing was on the wall. Right. And again, not writing him off, but he certainly has to come out and show. He's got to, he's got to prove it. And, and that's it. And so... To, to your point, Lance, he's got to come out and get an opportunity, and he will get that in the preseason, and we'll see what happens. All right, that is a great call, Lance. We appreciate you calling in, man. Make sure you do it again. Also, if you want to call in for the next show, 702-900-7869. Mo, we got about a minute left for you to let everybody know what you got going. I know you got a Bleacher Report Live coming up uh, after the game, I believe. So fill everybody in on what Midtown Mo is up to before the limo pulls up and takes you to your gig. <laughs> First things first, I've been I've been talking about it throughout the show, the sports not piece. Six Raiders that I have my eye on. As I said, DJ Glaze is one of them. Tyree Wilson is another one on that list. Check out the other four guys I have on the list. You can obviously guess the two quarterbacks are either two, but there are two other guys that I have my eye on. And as Scott just said, I'll be on after the Raiders Minnesota Vikings preseason game for a post-game reaction. What did we see? What did we like? What did we not like? What do we want to mm. see more of? It'll all be on Saturday over on the Bleach Report app. It will be, and we will be back here talking to all of you early next week where we'll go over a lot of the takeaways from the game. What do we learn? What didn't we learn? Who performed well? Who maybe didn't live up to the expectation we ex that, that we had, at least for these players? So we'll do that again. It's the first, first run, right? It's their first live action. Uh, and I know a lot of people don't like preseason because you don't see the starters. You're going to see starters, especially a quarterback. And I think you'll see some of those offensive linemen, uh, obviously those that are nursing injuries, not so much, but you are going to see a good spell of some guys out there. Not Devontae Adams, of course. You might see those young tight ends out there to give those quarterbacks some good targets. And, and most of all, Mo, I am just interested to see how Luke Getze puts together. Again, it's going to be more vanilla. They don't give away too much in the preseason, but it's going to be interesting to see what he does with those players, that those weapons, and how they run his offense. Definitely. Uh, look, if the offense looks good on Saturday, people are going to take a bit of a, a breath. If the offense looks terrible on Saturday, people are going to yep. be like, yep, we're, we're only winning four or five games. <laughs> I'm just ready for the overreaction and having to talk people off the ledge or oh, yeah. having to calm people down who who then think we're going to go seven, Ray's going to go 17 and 0 if the offense lights it up and scores 35 points. So I'm ready for it. Oh, of course. All right. Well, thank you all for being with us here on this edition of Silver and Black today. Odyssey Sports Original Podcast also heard over the air on 101.5 FM KDON in Las Vegas, as well as The Bet in Las Vegas. Thank you to our Las Vegas audiences for being with us. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your audio, and we will talk to you next week. Take care, everybody.